Welcome to the Awe and Wonder podcast. We're talking about literacy today, and we are so excited to have Gretchen Hansler with us. Yes. We're just beyond excited. Um, so I'm Sarah Kinsella. And I'm Brenda Del Monte. And Gretchen, we know you because we've seen you present at ATIA, Closing the Gap. Um, you just have so many ideas that are really practical and really exciting. And then I follow you on Instagram for your um, International Academy of Hope. So we want to hear a little bit about that. So will you introduce yourself and, and tell us who you are, what you do, and then tell us a little bit about um, I Hope, if you can. Sure. Well, it's exciting to be here. Um, let's see. My first degree is in occupational therapy. So I'm an OT. And I worked in the school system with lots of guidance from Caroline Musselwhite, who she can't, can't get rid of me now. Uh, <laughs> she helped us set up an AT uh, based center for our, our kids. And what happened is we had all this great AT all in place. And then we found that we weren't effectively able to teach these kids how to read and write. So mm -hmm. here we have the latest, greatest tools, all organized, great. And um, then I heard Karen Erickson and Caroline speak. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that is the missing link. There mm -hmm. is information for how to reach these kids with literacy and AAC. So I went back to school to work under Karen Erickson and she hasn't been able to get rid of me since either. <laughs> so um, I had the good fortune of having both of them yeah. guide me. And wow. so I went back and got my PhD in education. So I have like kind of a, a dual background in OT and now education. And I feel like that's served me really well in terms of the access AT piece and then um, the literacy knowledge of how to move these guys forward. Because wow. for the, the most significant disabilities, you really can't teach literacy effectively without AT, especially right. if these kids who can't use their hands, can't talk, you need something to help them be engaged and have an interaction around literacy. So that's my right. Yeah. Kind of like we all need multiple um, degrees, right? And whether we yeah. have it or not, we're, we're definitely doing multiple things. Oh my gosh. And so many speech paths I know are like honorary OTs doing mounting, making things on the fly. So I think there's a lot of overlap with everybody. Yeah. Today. I feel like the yeah. best, the best therapists are the ones that, that we're all like, I don't know what they are. <laughs> right? yeah. I don't know if there's bed. I don't know if they're OT. I don't know if they're SLP. That means you're doing it right. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, you asked about my school, the school that I yeah. work at is called the International Academy for Hope. And it's in New York City, right in Midtown, right near Times Square in the theater district. We love oh, yeah. theaters. <laughs> it's a separate school for kids with brain injuries. Uh, okay. And so there's tons of kids there from preschool to high school. And um, we have the good fortune of being able to, you know, set up and organize our own curriculum um, and Every kid has some form of AAC, robust AAC. Every kid has some way to write using an alternative pencil. And every kid has some way to access a book that's appropriate to their level. Um, all of our kids don't use speech to communicate. Many, Most of them uh, use wheel, many wheelchairs. About 60% of them have some kind of vision issue. Some mm -hmm. of them are blind. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them have cortical vision impairment a lot. Mm -hmm. And then we do have some kids with hearing impairments. And you know, follow us on Instagram and Facebook. We are very active. We always are posting wacky right. videos of like literacy experiences, AAC. Uh, but I think that really my background is inclusion in gen ed. And so when I came to a special separate school, I was kind of like, hmm. Mm. But I will say mm. that we're able to accomplish a lot because we have a large group of kids and we're not kind of like, you know, it's not a one off. off somebody else about you need to do this curriculum but there's this curriculum they need to do that we're able to really implement a robust AAC and literacy curriculum and see the change because we're able mm. to make sure it's consistent they're getting it regularly it's not like one time a week so right. in that sense right. I really hope that we're able to show like here's what's possible when you do this with kids for two years straight every day all and right. that will help inform everybody in Gen Ed. Wow, this stuff works if you give it to them every day. So I'm hoping right. to show by a large number, here's what it can look like when it's, and it's all, you know, based on the current research, the Center for Literacy and Disability Studies. Uh, yeah, so it's pretty exciting. <laughs> yes, if you, if listeners have not followed you on, uh, for I Hope, it, it's yeah. so amazing because uh, one thing we talk about a lot is just sharing resources and sharing ideas. And 
and we don't get to see enough um, mm -hmm. kid video, right, of kids actually doing the literacy activities and communicating. And, and you guys are so good about posting so much that it's just really helpful. Our so social person is amazing and she like totally gets it now and she knows all the switches she knows the devices and she'll be there in like two seconds if somebody's like oh my god you won't believe what's happening there you know nice yeah yeah, yeah i feel like that's been so far um on the interviews too that we are doing in this there's been just a lot of comments about you know we can read comprehensive literacy for all which is amazing we can read about this we can read articles we can we can um talk about it but there's nothing quite like seeing what does that look like how do i do that especially when you are able and you're in a place where you can gather data over time so right. and I, we can talk about it later but we've been able to see writing they're writing over the past 4 years and mm. what that looks like when kids write with an alternative pencil we can mm -hmm. see across four years. It's pretty remarkable. Wow. Well, I love that too, because I also feel like sometimes alternative pencils get abandoned because success isn't realized immediately. And when it's like, wait a minute, this take, it, it's so great. I feel like whenever we are advising people and we're like, Hey, you know, this is going to take two years or we give a, we give a large period of time and they kind of all go, wait, what? And then they also kind of breathe like, oh, okay, this is a marathon, not a sprint. And if in six weeks we're, the, we're at the same level, we're right on track. I mean, sometimes that just that kind of coaching on this is the realistic timeline. So don't abandon if you haven't seen significant improvement in a short period of time. That's a good message, right? And people feel relieved because they put it on themselves like, oh, I need to be teaching them how to do X, Y, Z. And it's like, it's okay. Right. Mm -hmm. like, like ex experience with the world in writing they don't need that right now it's okay right right we kind of get hung up on goals and and next steps and all of that and it is good to have that bigger picture yeah well we wanted to start with student-centered so we um we wanted to know if there was a student that comes to mind that just shocked you and made you realize that oh my goodness um every student needs opportunities for literacy instruction because if this kid can do it there's so many of others that i might not have thought could do it i know we all think we presume competence and, and potential and then there's that one that still surprises you and then you're shocked that you maybe you weren't completely presuming the confidence because you're still surprised but we wondered you know whenever we ask this question people go oh there's too many you know there's just so many to talk about and we know that but we, since we want to stay student focused, I feel like sometimes starting with a story about somebody who really impacted you or opened your eyes in this area is, is um, relatable to so many of our listeners. I love that. And you're right. I did have trouble whittling this down, <laughs> but I really did choose somebody. So there was a young man that I worked with who was in high school and he was completely deaf blind, right? He was most like Helen Keller, like profoundly deaf, couldn't see anything. And so his high school team, a wonderful group of professionals, wanted to do the best they could. They, you know, kept him, you know, happy, you know, kept him clean and fed and engaged him with activities. Uh, but everybody was really stuck. It's like, how do we do this? He didn't have a formal means of communication. It was tough. Mm -hmm. um, so we went in there and, you know, one of the first places we started was with literacy because we know literacy is learned through the interactions. We know that literacy is the perfect vehicle for teaching communication mm -hmm, and right. developing it. You can see it with little kids without disabilities, right? Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, we started with that and we introduced books, we introduced writing, we introduced textual symbols. Um, and so what we noticed like during shared reading, now shared reading is like a group reading activity where it's interactive, fun, let's talk about it, comment. It's just more of kind of a lap reading type of activity. We introduced hand in hand sign to him. Um, in the past, people didn't think he could really take advantage of sign language because he couldn't see it. Right. So we decided to do hand in hand and that was introduced to him. And then we found that over time during shared reading, he would put his hand out to feel for the facilitator who's doing the hand in hand sign. Oh, neat. Oh, what he could, what he understood we don't care, but we, we cared about, wow, this guy knows something is out there. So there's some information that's happening here. And he was reaching out to look for it. That was mm -hmm. huge. That was huge. Another thing that we did, um, he did printable chart writing. He was involved in that. And that's a group writing activity. 
that ends up as a book. So he was involved in shuffling around pieces of braille, symbols into an actual book. The last day of Purple Chat Writing is making the book. And this was a very personally meaningful book for him because he chose the symbols. It was an I like book. So we had I and braille, like and braille, and then the object that he liked. Mm-hmm. And so he was shuffling them around and a lot of support, but it didn't matter. He was touching and engaged with the materials. So we made this book for him. And during independent reading, he chose this book and he would hold it, turn it around, feel it, smell it, hold it upside down. He was engaged with the materials and interested. Mm -hmm. We introduced him to an alternative pencil, like a Braille flip chart. And Mm -hmm. he was starting to touch that. And, um, you know, people hadn't introduced him to Braille because they didn't think he was ready for it. Right. So guys, let's just do it. Here he is in high school. How's he if not now when that's what we always say how do you get ready if you're not being exposed to it you don't get better at something you don't have access to right and he's a great example because here he is in high school yeah right i'm sure well-intentioned people tried oh yeah maybe they tried to get him to read it we were just trying to do nice emergent literacy activities where it's exposure and so um we had this little braille flip chart and his we didn't have a fancy braille embosser or printer so the teacher used a little braille labeler where the little tape comes out. Mm-hmm. Well, that turned out to be great because he put a hands on it and he feel the movement of the little tape with the braille coming out. And so oh. he took it off and he would, he would feel it. He'd put it on his lip. He would explore it. Mm-hmm. And so that was amazing. All those things were embedded in interactions. And then he graduated, right? People were like, why didn't we start this sooner? And it's because mm-hmm. nobody knew. No one's a bad person. Right, right, right. He's a high schooler and he started doing this stuff. It's never too late. Right. And it doesn't matter about the disability as long as we meet him with the materials that he needs and the modeling and exposure to lots of different things, not just one thing. Yeah, no right. To, you know, get tactile symbols, braille. Um, so that was really a big thing, I thought. It's like, yeah. gosh, do this for... For him, we could right. do this for anybody, you know? Right, yeah. And I, I love that. I love how you said it's, it's never too late. And then I love the distinguish, the, what's the word I'm thinking of? Distinguishing between the exposure, they taught it to reading maybe, but the exposure to it, and that's how he's learning it. He's exposed to the, to the Braille and the words and the activities, and then he's learning from those interactions. Yeah, that, I love everything you were just talking about. Yeah, and it's like you're never too disabled, right? Is is part of that story too. It's never too late and you're never too disabled. And I think those are some pretty significant guiding principles. I'm wondering what are some of your other guiding principles that you've learned along the way? Well, this dovetails right onto it. This nails it. So people need to understand the difference between emergent literacy and early conventional literacy. And so emergent literacy, I think we all know it and don't realize it. Emergent literacy is just the literacy that starts at or before birth and goes until like preschool or kindergarten, right? So all those early literacy experiences, kids fooling around, being exposed to print, messing with crayons, eating and ripping books, singing alphabet songs, singing rhyming songs, playing games, watching everybody in the environment read and write, learning what it means to be a reader and writer. Uh, so many things where they're experimenting, exploring, and making tons of errors. It's all natural and normal. And we just give kids these experiences without even thinking about it. It's just Mm. a natural thing. And so those experiences pave the way and build the groundwork for kids to become early conventional readers and writers. So I think I, I I read in a research study somewhere that kids at that age get over a thousand hours of literacy experiences, which prepare them to become early conventional readers and writers. So early conventional liter- literacy, kids are reading actual words. They're writing things that we can read. They're not scribbling at th- anything anymore. So it's very different. So those early emergent literacy experiences are full of errors, scribbles, mistakes, ripping, eating, randomness, inconsistentness, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We hear a lot about our kids. We hear that word random and inconsistent. Well, that's normal for emergent literacy. And mm-hmm. if you think of the term emergent, it means that the skills and concepts are emerging. They're not solidified yet. And so as kids develop more knowledge, they develop into early conventional readers where they get it now. They know what it means to read and use a book. They know what it means to be a writer. And now they can make sense of it. 
Mm-hmm. So I think it's really important for people to help people understand that because if you think about our students, what was their life like when they were little between like birth and preschool, kindergarten, mm-hmm. I, I, be, I bet that they weren't holding crayons and making marks. They weren't able to hold a book. They weren't right. able to talk during book reading activities and right. ask questions and make comments. They weren't able to talk and play rhyming games and sing songs. They couldn't use their hands to manipulate letters and all these other things. Mm-hmm. So the message here is they have had pretty poor emergent literacy experiences. Most, most kids. I mean, it depends, right? It depends. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think when our kids are little, people certainly read to them. But if you have a significant physical disability and a vision issue, it's going to be really hard to do that stuff yourself. It's also going to be, especially a vision issue, to see gain print awareness mm-hmm. if you can't, right? Yeah. The other thing that for many parents, man, literacy is not a priority when those kids are little. They're right. dealing with medical issues, feeding, positioning, really important, just get through the day stuff. Right. right. Bottom line is most of our kids have had really crummy emergent literacy experiences, which makes it really hard for them to become early conventional readers and writers. And the reason I'm saying this is I see such a mismatch. Mm. I see such a mismatch. I see so many kids getting early conventional instruction, like drilled on sight words and copying. Mm-hmm. Right. I have no idea what books are for. They right. don't even know that when I read, it's that those squiggles on the page. Right. They have any of those emergent literacy experiences. So a lot of the kids that we have at our school, especially the older ones, are emergent readers and writers. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's okay. That's yeah. okay. I'm not saying developmentally they're they don't have the co- we're not saying they have the cognitive status of like a you know right an, it could be any age. Yeah. Experientially, they've never had those things. Mm-hmm. They've never experienced them. And so what our goal is, is to fill them up with those experiences so that they can develop those emergent literacy skills and move along that continuum to early conventional literacy. And we give them age respectful stuff. We're not giving them baby books. Mm-hmm. Bottom line is make the distinction between emergent literacy and early conventional literacy and figure out where your kids are on that continuum. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, we got to move away from the they're not ready, right? Yeah. Not right. ready. You think about it from emergent literacy, emergent literacy perspective. No one has to be ready, right? Right. Crayons, when, when, whenever we give them books, we give them all these things before they even know what to do with it. Right. It goes back to what you were saying. How are they ever going to get good at using a tool unless we give it to them? And right. that's what we do for kids without disabilities. We give them that stuff without thinking about it. The thing so is, would you ever think to quiz um, an 18 month old or tell an 18 month old to to follow these directions related right. to reading and writing, right? And so in that emergent, we're not we're never testing literacy no. skills or knowledge on that. And 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 so when an older student is in emergent reading, I think because of their age, we dive into trying to figure out what they know through testing rather than through experience. Experience. And I think that the age is what um, can kind of trip people up. It's like, oh, you're five. It's like, yeah, but two of those years were in the hospital or what? I mean, you know, some of our kids, right? And the whole pyramid of nece- of need was being was was living being lived out as far as just just survival. And so you you actually get to go through exploration without test. Yeah. It's true. It's very true. And I think you know. Teachers and professors are so well-meaning, but like a lot of of the teachers haven't been trained on emergent literacy unless they're an early intervention person. But like when you go to school to be a teacher, you're taught how to teach kids conventional reading and writing, not Mm -hmm. emergent literacy. So uh, it's a different, a different thing. And it's people need to kind of throw their hat over the fence and feel okay with not knowing immediately what the kid knows and just like following their lead. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's, it's, definitely a hard one, but I would suggest that people go to the center for literacy and disability studies and, or get the comprehensive um, literacy for all book by uh, Copenhagen Erickson. They have, there's, there's a checklist. It's like, how do you decide who needs what? How do you decide if your yeah. kid urgent literacy or how do you decide if your kids need early convention? Right. Yeah. So check that out because you got to figure out where your kid's at on this continuum so you can give the most appropriate instruction. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, like 
do stuff that's, you know, not, that's just not appropriate yet. Um, so for, for our listeners who are maybe listening to what you're saying and thinking, okay, the mismatch, if I have that in my classroom, I'm doing that, right? I mean, I, so what, what kind of starting point would you say if they're like, I, now I know, I know better and I want to do better. Is it finding out kind of where your kids are doing that checklist or what else would you say? I, you know, I would get started with instruction right away. And so Karen Erickson read an article in 2017 that outlines comprehensive literacy instruction for emergent kids and comprehensive literacy instruction for early conventional kids. And so in terms of emergent literacy, she suggests five instructional routines, shared reading, right? That's group fun, interactive reading. She suggests lessons for building alphabet knowledge and sound awareness, shared writing, such as predictable chart writing, and independent reading and independent writing. So she suggests having lessons addressing those things every and day. Doing all of those things every day. Yeah. It's not possible because we know, you know, someone's going to be sick. Someone has an accident. Someone yeah. needs to leave the classroom for a pullout or whatever. Um, so we know it can't happen every day, but in a mm-hmm. genetic classroom, those things happen every day. Right. And it's not a continuum. It's not master shared reading before oh, alphabetic no, knowledge, no. before writing, before it's not continuum. It, it's it's simultaneous. And I think that can be a mindset shift for a lot of people. So I think you're absolutely right. They're all interconnected and they happen together at once. Um, and there's so for emergent literacy, there's no mastery involved at all. They're not they don't have to be ready. They don't have to master these things. They just have to be exposed to them. And actually, we're the ones that need to master things. We need to understand how to do these lessons. <laughs> right. So the lessons are actually on us. <laughs> right. Uh, but I would I would start by looking at Karen's article. And then that kind of in very clear, simple language outlines what each of these instructional routines are and why you need to be doing them. And then if you want to know more about the details of how to do it, you can look at the book Comprehensive uh, Literacy for All by David David Copenhagen, Karen Erickson. That'll explain like in the classroom, what does this look like? Mm-hmm. And it really yes. is teacher. It is teacher friendly. Yeah, mm-hmm. it is. It is. Yeah. You read it and then read it again and read it again and get so much more out of it every time you read it. Yeah, and there's a lot of stuff on YouTube about it, right? Don't they have like book clubs about it? Facebook. Yeah, we, yeah. So I love that. What are there other guiding principles? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I figured you did have them. You already said it. Um, read, you know, we know that literacy consists of like reading, writing, listening, and talking, right? All those things are happening at the same time. Um, it's not in a hierarchical sequence. They used to believe that first you learn how to listen, then you learn how to talk, then you learn how to read. And if you're really lucky, you learn how to write. So that is absolutely not true. Those things happen at the same time. And so reading, I said reading and writing, which means we have to include ways for our kids to write, listening, building their receptive language and talking. And instead of talking for our students, it's going to be using a communication system. Mm -hmm. So that means that as the, the professionals, we need to make sure kids have access to a robust AAC system and a way to write. So it's really hard to develop literacy skills if you don't have those two things. Otherwise, you're just listening to somebody reading, <laughs> right? So all those things need to be there to have some kind of interaction. And I feel like, you know, the AC part is really important. We need to understand how to use it. I think we get stuck in noun town and yes, no. Mm-hmm. And you can't have a good literacy activity with just those things, with eat, drink, and toilet, and yes, no, that just doesn't work. Mm-hmm. So think about like shared reading when you're doing a lap reading, you know, kids, little kids sitting in your lap, right? And you're reading to them. It's rarely a situation where it's just you reading, right? They're at making comments, they're asking questions, they're making personal connections, they're telling you to act it out, everything like that. The point is yeah. there's a huge discussion going on and our kids need the same opportunities. Mm-hmm do this all the time during shared reading. Our goal is to foster an interaction with them learning to use their AC device, doing the same things. Instead of answering questions, we're trying to get them to ask questions, Mm -hmm. to give their opinion, to make positive or negative comments, right? We're, we're trying to just load them up so they can 
give us something so we can come back with to them. So we're trying to make it a two-way interactive situation. Um, so yeah, and uh, let's see, I had one other thought about that. Um, and the, and the other thing is you're not looking for accuracy with any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. You're looking right. for inspiration so that you can learn about it. And, and then, you know, the adults need to learn how to use these things and they need to learn how to model on the AAC devices. And when we say model, we don't need mean the traditional model from special ed where I do it, then you do it right after me. We right. need a model to show them that you could talk with this AAC device and you talk on their device so they can watch you talk. So you can be modeling, oh, this is how this thing works. And they can choose to use it or not. Mm -hmm. So the modeling part is really, really important. And I think you mentioned it already. The other piece is teaching versus testing. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't go down the, the road of the show me therapy, point to the, find the, we got to move away. That's testing. Mm -hmm. Right. Teach these kids. Uh, so that they can get to the point where they could do some of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very big one. Um, and if you want, if you want to learn more about any of this stuff, go to project core mm -hmm. and it has all these videos about like how to do shared reading, how to set up an AC system. And it's, they actually have downloadable boards there, like yes. paper, paper boards of AAC systems with core vocabulary. And core yeah. vocabulary is fantastic because it's 85% of our conversations. So if you're going to teach kids something, you could teach them core because you can use it in every single sentence that you say during shared reading. So right. I would and a great resource, go to project four and download those AAC boards. Yeah. There's no, no reason you couldn't start right away just from doing that. It's free. It's easy. Yeah. 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 I went to one of their presentations at Isaac and they're, they're starting to pull in more data for how these kids have progressed mm. um, using AAC, using the core boards. And they reported on some results um, using the communication matrix. And many of the kids that started off in the study were pre-symbolic and mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. gains moving along with the communication matrix with abstract core vocabulary. Wow, yeah. That's neat. yeah, that's great data. That yeah. is. Data. More then, it's it's the really exciting. Yeah, there's just so much, so much that um, is available and it's so exciting to see all of the research and the progress and how it's progressing. Um, I just wanted to put a plug out for the communication matrix that you mentioned, because, you know, we talk about the teaching, not testing. And but, you know, when you're in schools, we do have the IEPs and it's and we have to think about what, how are we doing the goals and how do we measure progress? And sometimes the progress can look really different and we have to look for it and see what it what that is mm -hmm. um and so i love the communication matrix because it does show you um it, it it's very clear and it shows you all those steps and and you can give it again and and see how students have progressed and i love it with families because I think sometimes you show them and they say, yes, I, I knew this, but you, I'm really seeing that data that I haven't really heard of before um, and seeing that progress. That's exciting. So I appreciate, I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. 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 Um, I had a couple other thoughts on guiding principles um, in terms of getting started. I think people might lose interest. People, I think teachers get frustrated because they try this stuff and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes because it's not personally meaningful to the kid. Mm -hmm. So it's all about things being personally meaningful, right? Mm -hmm. To get them interested because you got to start with what the kids know and build off of that. And one of the best examples that I could think of is this high schooler uh, at our, at our school, actually, she just graduated. She was learned. She's a high schooler, right? And so she was an emergent reader and writer, though she was in high school. Um, she does have vision issues, and people had been working for a while on drilling her on sight words. And it's like, okay, guys, let's back up. She can't see the words. Um, mm -hmm. She needs to understand what books and writing are for. Let's back up and fill her up with some emergent literacy experiences. And so she's totally into guys, completely into guys. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we use Tar Heel Reader a lot, which is this really great uh, book website with free books that have been designed and written for our students. And so we went on there and they have great alphabet books there. And we found this alphabet 
book called The A to Z of Hot Guys. Yep. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We I know it and it. we've shared it with each other. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So our student was like, not good. She's like, I can do better than that. So oh, good. she wrote her own A to Z of Hot Guys. Oh, fun. Guys on it. Personally meaningful. She worked so hard on that mm. right? in terms of using the alphabet and her alternative pencil to mm-hmm. choose letters to listen for sounds, you know, names of guys that start with that letter. So mm. she did it all auditorily. Mm-hmm. And she didn't need to see the letters to do that, right? right. We're trying to get her to do sound spelling. Mm-hmm. So, um, it was perfect, right? Christian. So we met her emergent literacy needs, made a personally meaningful connection, worked on the alphabet with her in a personally meaningful manner and age respectful, I should say. Right, I love that. Can So- our listeners have a range of like experience with AC and literacy and these terms for people who are a little bit unfamiliar about the auditory piece that you're talking about partner assisted. Um, can you explain how that would work? Like with the names or what, what would you be, what would the teacher be doing in the student? So in this case, this student used an alternative pencil where she chose letters through partner assisted auditory scanning. And so all, majority of our, many of our students are scanners. They can't use their fingers to point to things and touch things. So they use switches to indicate what they want. So when she uses this flip book, which is her alternative pencil, the partner scans through the choices. And when she hears what she wants, she indicates with a switch connected to Evoca that says, that's the one I want. And she might use a second, she uses a second switch connected to another Voca that says, no, nope, not that one. Mm-hmm. So, voice VOCA, I'm just gonna say VOCA for oh, is sorry. voice output communication aid, right? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. And it, that would be things like a step by step, a sequencer, a Big Mac. Um, okay. We use the medley a lot from Adaptivation. It okay. has eight ports in it, so it's like having eight single message devices in one teeny box. Nice. And okay. That is, it's been so good because people can have eight pre-programmed messages and they just move the switch to the mm-hmm. messages that the, they want the kid to have for like partner systems. It, again, the medley by adaptivation. Super. We love that. Love so that. is the te- is the teacher saying the letter or the sound or both? Letter. And so what she would say is, okay, let's go through the first group. Let me know if there's something there you want. A, B, C, D, E. If the student wants something in that group, she would say, that's the one. And mm-hmm. then we go through each one of those letters and we give them an opportunity to look at the letter. So this is like a flip book where it's got the groups on front and then each page in the book is one letter. Okay. And so we go and say A, and we just go through the single letters in that one group. And then, so we're giving her the opportunity to use or engage her vision if she wants, she doesn't have to, Um, For kids with CVI, we are not, not, not requiring them to look at any print, um, but it's there as a therapy tool in case they want to engage their vision. And then she'll make a choice and then we'll write it down. And And so the teacher does that. The teacher will do partner-assisted auditory scanning or or the therapist might, our OTs or speech paths might do it as well. Thank you for that explicit instruction because um, we Mm -hmm. know what you're talking about, but we also know that our listeners sometimes don't know the acronyms and don't know, don't, if we talk too much, like everyone knows it, then it alienates people too. But um, the thing about vision impairment is that sometimes it seems like it's almost a competing system. So it's like, if they're listening, they almost um, can't be trying to process visual information. If they're processing visual information, they're not really hearing what you're saying. At least that's what I've observed. And so I, you're presenting it and then they can decide if I need, if I can't look at it and process what you're saying, then I won't look at it. The other thing with CVI is that they're using a lot of peripheral vision. So you're not even assessing like, are they looking at it? Because if they are using peripheral, they might be looking right at it and it doesn't look like it to you. So it's like, let's give them the tools and let them have the discernment. Am I going to use my eyes? Am I going to use my ears? Am I going to use my peripheral? Am I going to look straight at it? And there's no wrong way to do it except for not exposing them at all to it, right? So as long as they have the auditory input and the visual option, then they begin to navigate their own sensory system around those things. I think too, it's important, you know, there's three different phases. I mean, I'm not a TVI, but I've worked around a lot of them. Yeah. There's three different phases. I've taken Perkins courses too. 
I, there are three different phases to CVI, phase one, phase two, phase three. And in right. phase one, aren't even using their vision at all. Right. right. So it's really all auditory. In phase two, they're starting to process things, but they're, they can't really identify them. They're, and complexity is an issue. You're not, they're only, you know, learning to look at one or two things. And in phase three, they're making more sense of things or able to process things with more accuracy. So it's, you know, and that's very global, but the important part is you need to know like where your students are. So you give yeah. them the adaptations because it's very different for each phase. But I think the bottom line is we can, I was going to say this at the end, but I'll say it now because it's appropriate. We cannot let vision be the gatekeeper to AAC or literacy. Right. Mm -hmm. Not because that me if we, we got to resist the temptation to give them only what they could see. Right. right. We have plenty of kids are working on looking at one or two things. If we gave them one or two letters and restricted to that, we have diluted the situation so much. If yeah. I too often, I see people who are, you know, are working on AAC with a kid with CVI who's like spastic and they have like four symbols set out for them and the kid's trying to right. you know, get over it. And he's got to master the tactuals first. Right. But that's right. not, that's not it. We can't, we've limited his AAC to what he can see and touch. Right. And so we got to go auditory, remove the vision out of the mix and try auditory scanning or some other auditory means and don't right. rely on the vision. Cause then we're, we're losing communication. Right. Well, then, then we're measuring maybe vision, maybe we're measuring access. We're certainly not measuring literacy, understanding or commerce oh, skills, right? No. Like right. we're not, we're not doing that. You know, I just did an evaluation with a boy who was 16. He was born at 25 weeks gestation 16 years ago. So he's just his own little miracle, um, legally blind and a CP, but ambulatory legally blind. So, I mean, all the hard potential access yeah. things. And he has this high contrast keyboard on um, on a um, voice output device, and um, they said he was they they pulled him out of school because they said there wasn't enough academics, so they're doing homeschooling, and he is doing trigonometry, and he took biology, um, human biology, and so she read this scenario, this medical scenario, and said, "What do you think is the best solution?" And she was supposed to give him A, B, C, or D. And he started typing and he typed hysterectomy. Oh my goodness. As a 16 year old, like I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't think either of my kids when they were 16 could type that word or <laughs> what was or problem solve that situation. But that when, when I was talking to that mom, she was like the, I felt like the vision was the gatekeeper to his education and to literacy. And I, I wasn't being heard. So I pulled. And it was like, gosh, I, we have to tell this story because er, no one goes into um, special education without best intentions. Everyone's there mm -hmm. to try to help and do the right thing. But if we we are assuming so much around vision and cognition, if we're not, if we're letting that run the show. Mm -hmm. And I, that's such an amazing story. And the whole vision being a gatekeeper we got to, you know, there's all these competing agendas, right? People mm -hmm. want to work on vision, which they do. They totally mm -hmm. need to work on vision stuff, but not during literacy time. Mm -hmm. Perhaps not during ABC, right? Because right. Language, what is your goal? Right, right. And so that way everybody wins. But I think what, what, what I've seen at other conferences, actually, I've gone to a lot of other presentations and seen kind of what, what's happening. I think people are reducing the visual complexity, which those kids need. The kids with CVI have a horrible time with busy, complex things. So what happens is they reduce the complexity, but at the same time, they also reduce the content. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You get yeah. less yeah. language, you get less literacy. And so all we need to do is flip it and just say, you know what, reduce it, reduce the visual complexity, but we're going to change the presentation of it. So they still have access to the same content, the right. same amount of content. Good point. Um, that's, that's like, that to me is a really big deal. And that's why a lot of our kids are doing auditory scanning. Mm -hmm. yeah. Seeing that literacy can be taught auditorily to these kids who are, are, you know, have phase two CVI, phase one CVI, and who can't point to things, right? They're right. using this and they're learning it. And we're doing it all through partner assisted scanning. And the thing is, is, sometimes I've heard people say, well, I mean, if it's auditory, then they're never going to be able to read a book on their own. 
And it's like, because their vision is too poor and that kind of thing. And it's like, well, but we need the auditory so that you can spell. I mean, right. right? That is what they're going to do on their own. And so there's, it's like, there's this thought that, well, if they're not going to be, if they're never can be completely independent, then why would we go there? And it's like, oh, what do you have to say to that? It's a really good question. (laughs) Um, But I agree with that. Um, So here's the deal. So this is what keeps me up at night. I worry about the kids that we're going to be graduating soon with who are severely medically involved. Yeah. Because what's their life going to be like when they go home? The reality is like they're at home. They're maybe not going to a a workshop or maybe there's no placement for them. So they're going to be home probably with helpers, um, different nurses, different nurses, people that come and go. Right. Likelihood of these people setting up all the kids AAC systems the right way. Right. may, May, you know, who knows if they will or not. Right. What those people could do, they'd be, they would feel a lot more comfortable with an, the alphabet with like a paper mm-hmm. keyboard, right? Mm-hmm. So if we mm-hmm. just give our kids the ability to do one or two letters of the word they're thinking of, mm-hmm. that would be, so, um, for example, um, we have a lot of kids who li- live near central park. And so let's pretend that this one helper asked the kid, what do you want to do today? And then she lists out the alphabet, like with scanning on a paperboard or using her hands. And the kid might smile when they heard the letter P. Mm-hmm. Help them might be, oh, did you want to go to the park today? Right. So from the context, if the kid can give you, you know, the first one or two letters, right. you're going to be able to figure it out. Right. right. That could be done with no tech. Right. right. So the part is the one that talk, talk, taught me about this. You can, you can do scanning on your hand. You can go A, B, C, D, E. Right. Mm-hmm. H-I-J. Right. So a parent, anybody could do that with their kid while they're in bed, you know, right. and, and it's that information. And, and then don't you think that the perception of these kids would be totally different? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and to talk about access to letters and alphabet, like Brenda, your story is a great example. Hysterectomy is not going to oh be in the oh right? You need yeah. to be able to spell. And yeah, I love, I love that perspective, Gretchen, of thinking about what, what is going to be set up for them? What is accessible and available? That's, yeah. I think we need to make sure people understand we're not trying to get them to spell everything. Right. Not, right. Mm-hmm. That's ridiculous. We will letting, we will be letting spelling be the gate, gatekeeper then using symbols with like pre on phrases, words, and sentences is always going to be faster. And so the spelling yeah. would be for things that are not on their device or they can't find it. Um, or it's just like they're tired and they just know what they want to say directly. But right. I'm, talking, I'm talking about the kids who are like physically significantly involved. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. And this the boy that I was just telling you about, he had a yes, no page and he exited and went to alphabet and spelled Y E S because he was not having it. I mean, he wasn't having the symbols that, it, it, and it was, it was green and red and happy and, sm- and you know, like all the, what, what everybody thinks you might need. And then he went back to spell because he that's that's a consistent location piece too the cordy layout, and um I, yeah it was just super impressive. But you no, know, I I go back to when I used to work in the United Cerebral Palsy and the um, intelligibility of speech was so low, and I would be like, hey, give me a category and a first letter. And I had read somewhere along the way, I think it was in the '90s, the research was like, you know, you're going to guess it 90 percent of the time if you have the context and the first letter yeah. of a word. Yeah, and so um if you're asking a pointed question, where should we go today? You already have context that it's a place. And then someone gives you a P and you're going to guess it after a couple of, a, a couple of guesses, as long as your child or has a way or your student has a way to indicate yes and no. So it's like, we don't need to make this more complicated than letters. And so then, then we're talking about 26 symbols or letters or right. ideas, right? What could be more stable than that? Right. Yeah. That is, Yeah. That's and any, any caregiver already knows those letters, <laughs> right? Right, right. Some of these kids' tech is pretty intimidating. And if you're like a visiting nurse or filling in for somebody one day, right. the reality is it's not going to happen. 
Right. right. I gaze, gaze is very um, fickle. You, you know, you have to set that up right. And two step scanning, auditory preview, man, any little glitch in those switches or the setup in your, in your host. And it's like, what, how do we set this up so that um, anybody can be successful? Well, they have to have had that instruction on literacy. Right. You know, one right. of the things we know with these complex bodies is that they don't, they don't always have a lot of background knowledge when it comes to um, age respectful um, literacy. Like, so you want to be age respectful, but then you're like, ah, do they have enough background knowledge to, to apply that to something of an average 16 year old's life experience? So what do you do to build background knowledge? We're just reading a lot of books and doing a lot of hands-on things. Mm-hmm. So, uh, we're the, at our school right now, they're doing a lot about disability pride. Okay. And so we're going to be doing, you know, they're reading books about it. They're writing about it. Um, they're going to be having a parade themselves. So okay. let's do a lot of hands-on stuff and combine it with mm-hmm. reading age respectful books. And right. so it's a simple, t- it's a, it's not like this big, you know, chapter it's a, a kid's book and the topic is really appropriate. And so we just do a lot of hands-on stuff to build the background knowledge, to fill in those holes. Cause you're right. Our kids don't have the background knowledge. It's like Swiss cheese just because of, you know, their ability to see things and manipulate things. They don't experience the world the same way. So they're missing a lot. Mm-hmm, uh, right. So we do, we expose them to lots of different topics. We're not like working on weather. We're not working on clothes. We're not working on the calendar all the time. Right. We're, right. we're introducing meat to them. Right. Mm-hmm. What, what yeah. other people are talking about, right. When they go listen at the dinner table, these are things that come up. Are you um, in building wings, Retopia, any particular curriculum or what are you looking at? We are going to be getting a Retopia go and okay. excited about that. We're going to be starting Retopia. Let's see what else are we, um, we were, we are using Meville to Weville huh? used to be sold by AbleNet. And we had started that like four years ago because there was nothing else for right. us. So, mm-hmm. Meville to Weville. so we've got it. We've got a lower school, a middle school and a high school. <clears throat> and we have different curriculum set up at different levels because everybody should be doing something different. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're using, um, we're just trying to cobble these things in right, right. now, for really sensory based kids. We've been using a, a curriculum called tell me more by Carol Zangari. Yes. Oh yeah. Are you, it's great, right? Yeah. The core. Yeah. 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 Kid classic kids books, like all out of the Eric Carl books. And a lot of AAC is already built in with that oh, early books. The vocabulary is there. Right. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. perfect for teaching core. Um, mm-hmm. So we're doing that. And then let's see, we're using this. We use the equals curriculum, which is like a math curriculum that AbleNet used to sell. Okay. And, you know, we modify that quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's a, a curriculum online that we felt called core knowledge. And we're using parts of that. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. It's interesting to hear, you know, that it's because even with these kind of specialized curriculums, you still have to modify and you still yeah. bring in all different things. And I, we hear that a lot from educators, it's like, well, we're doing this and this and a little bit of that. And I take it my way, you know, so but it's I, really interesting to hear that. And I will say that our, t- our teachers are amazing and they work so hard, but I think having things like Retopia Go and Retopia in place will make it easier because the lessons have already been kind of designed for kids who can't use their hands and can't. Yeah. Uh, but our teachers have become masterful in knowing how to do critical chart writing, shared reading, and all those other in- instructional routines. Um, mm-hmm. and, you know, what happens is you understand that routine and you change out the content. Mm-hmm. Right? If you do a shared read. If you know how to do shared reading, you can do that with any book. Right. Right. Uh, the process of critical chart writing you can do that. You can also do that to accompany different books and have that be your writing activity. Right. Right. I think that there's a trick between using a lot of that curriculum and then ha- having it be student directed. So it's like, we're doing Sacagawea out of Retopia, but then there's a, n- another section where it's like, you get to pick your topic. So it's like, there's when students get to pick their topics, you don't get to come in with a lo- with a big plan. So right. you do have to be like, no matter what book they pick, I know how to do a shared reading experience with them. I know how to highlight a uh, first letter. I know, right, the phonemic alphabetical knowledge, right? I know how to help them do predictable trite writing on any book they choose. Exactly. So you have to build those skills so that you can have it student directed. If not, then, you know, you're doing all, you're doing all the planning, right? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And I think once teachers get comfortable with these things, 
they understand like what concepts they're working on right in that like in printable chart writing there's so many different literacy skills that you're working on and i think teachers feel more comfortable with that because then they're like well I'm not working on teaching them to read the word right now, but here are all the other concepts about print and alphabet knowledge and funny funnel awareness. Yeah. I'm working on, so yeah. Gretchen, um, you've talked a lot about vision and how it relates to literacy. Um, is that your passion or what, what do you feel most passionate about related well, to literacy? Writing. <laughs> right. Yeah. You're writing and just trying to get writing on the radar for our guys because if you look at them, you know, if they have vision issues, they have physical issues, writing is typically not on the radar for them because it's, it's hard. How do you do the, get around the physical and vision parts? Um, but there are a whole host of alternative pencils out there that contain the full alphabet. Uh, and you got to pick the one or design the one that matches the kid's physical and vision needs. Mm-hmm. Writing is a way for kids to express themselves, right? right. It gives them power. Uh, writing is a way for us to know like what's in their head. Right. Writing a direct window in about what they know about literacy, you know, but right. mainly it gives them power. They, they can learn what it means to be a writer because our kids don't know that because they've never written before with the full alphabet. I'm talking mm-hmm. about the full alphabet here. People mm-hmm. say, oh, they write, but it's writing with sentences and that ain't writing. Mm-hmm. That, right. Choices of sentences. Those are our ideas. Um, mm-hmm. You need to learn that writing starts in your head and then you can use this thing here with all these squiggles to get it out. Right, um, right. Like, you know, writing is critical. Emergent writing is so important. Um, I think too often people equate writing for our guys with copying and spelling. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's not what writing is. Right. Writing starts in your head. Writing is for self-expression, coming up with your own ideas and getting it out in whatever way you want. And in the beginning, you guys know when kids start writing, it spells nothing. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm it doesn't spell anything and that's okay right and yeah so all of our kids if they write scribble with their alternative pencil like random letters that's okay and you still well, get excited I will say, like even in my story um he's typed out yes and then he typed a c z and then he typed i can see better he said he said he he did see better so it's like a c z i don't know why that was in there I, I don't know what that was supposed to be. And guess yeah. what? He was still a wildly effective uh, writer because of his spelling. And there's still miss hits or at least miscommunication. ACZ might stand for something, but I don't, I didn't get it. So, right. you know what I'm saying? It's like a hundred percent is not what we're headed for. It's like g- letting them type what they're going to type and become, become an investigator on what those letters mean to uh, attributing letters, meaning to the letters they're using. Yeah. And I think that's so important. I think we need to start with the emergent writing mm-hmm. where it's just like the little kid writing, right? right? But we're not, but, but with tip with kids without disabilities, we're gauging their writing through how they're forming the letters, Right. We're not doing that with our students who can't use their hands. Right. We're gauging their writing by the letters that they produce. Mm-hmm. And what happens is people look at that and it's like, Oh, that doesn't spell anything. That's wrong. Right. Um, I, it's okay for kids who've never written for the full alphabet before that's okay. Right. That's the way for the process. To be. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, so um, what about how, so if you have someone who's maybe a little reluctant or, you know, just getting, thinking about getting buy-in from our people, you know, like maybe they don't see quite how the student is going to be a writer. Um, what do you, what kind of, what have you found successful for eliciting buy-in? I think, showing them samples. Oh, first of all, showing them what emergent writing looks like. What does mm-hmm. writing development look like in, for kids without disabilities? And saying, look, this is all we're going for. We're not going for spelling here. We're going for this kid's never written with a full alphabet, doesn't know their letters. They need to just start with this alternative pencil and just scribble, right? So I would right. teach them about what emergent writing itself is and then show them examples of other kids like ours. Mm-hmm. Plenty mm-hmm. of stuff on YouTube now where parents and therapists are posting things of kids writing with like flip charts, you know, writing with their eyes and have it not be anything just yet. So mm-hmm. that's why people need to see it, right? They're skeptic. Huh, I don't know about this, but revisiting emergent literacy and saying, look, nobody has to be ready for this. They don't right. have to. Be- you give a kid a crane without even think twice about it. Let's do this. Right. 
but you got to make sure they model it, using it, have a real reason to write, no drilling or copying, and just let the kid write whatever they want. Right, yeah. right. And once, once people see it, you, you don't unsee it, right? That, then you are like, I want to do that with my students. <laughs> I, right. want, I want and, that for my students. And it's all about the interaction. They got to make it fun. Got to make it super mm. fun. Yes, yes. Not a drill. So if somebody wants to learn about how to use an alternative pencil with their student, where would they start? I would go to the Center for Literacy and Disability Studies and read about it. I would check out Karen's and David's book. I would go ahead and, you know, search it on YouTube. There's lots of examples. Talk to your OT, talk to your vision teacher about the best physical mode where they could access it. And then visually, if your kid has a vision issue, how it should be visually presented to the students. Yeah. So they see it. I learn about all of them, um, model them with no expectation that the kid is going to repeat what mm -hmm. you just did. Let them pick a topic to write about that they care about. Don't mm -hmm. tell them what they want to write about because it might be that they don't write them. They might just shut down. Right. And then right. Like, oh, you know, they really can't do this. When in fact it was just us, we didn't make it exciting enough. Mm -hmm. Right. Don't let us be the barrier. That's, right. I like that. Mm -hmm. Right. Keep track of their writing right? Kind of assemble kind of a portfolio. In our school, each kid has a PowerPoint notebook mm -hmm. and it's on, it's on the uh, OneDrive where mm -hmm. all of the staff can access it. So if the OT is doing writing with the kid, it can go into that notebook. If the SLP is doing writing, it can go into that notebook. When the teacher does writing, go in the notebook. So it's Great all idea. so you can go back over a period of time and see what they were doing. Right. Um, and I think you know, start a scribbler's support group like, <laughs> where people get so disheartened. It's like, ah, oh, it's not changing. We got to remember that change occurs over time. Right. Little kids without disabilities get like four years yeah. before they're finally writing something that makes sense. You know, and our kids need the same yeah. amount of time, even more given their physical issues, speech right. issues, and possible vision issues. It's like, it's not fair. We need to give them that time. Um, and I think uh, I have one really good story. There's this just remarkable guy at our school. Um, and he, he's he got CVI. He doesn't see the letters. And he's done all of this auditorily. And he uses a, a flip book. And he's he's one of those kids you could work with all day. He's, mm -hmm. just, he's learning to scan with two switches. And I just want to point out too, like these kids, all of our kids are not proficient scanners. Right. They're not using the switches at all, but they're learning to use the switches during this. So we're right. not waiting to find the right switch site. So he loves to write. And he started out in 2018 with his PowerPoint notebook. Um, and he would choose all different things to write about. And when he first started, it was just random letters, random, random letters. Mm -hmm. And it's interested and engaged and having a great time. He would pick topics to write about. Over time, he started becoming interested in punctuation because I gave him like a special keys page with space, period, um, exclamation point and question mark. He started to become fascinated with that. And during our mm -hmm. sessions, he just picked space the whole time. He wouldn't even pick a letter. <laughs> <laughs> totally engaged as I flipped and navigated through the alphabet. And then um, over time, he started writing letters and was more um, deliberate with them. He wasn't repeating the same letters. And so mm -hmm. you'd see A, B, space, period, JJJ. So he was very, very careful. And he got very good. He developed good skills with navigating. Uh, and then let's see, then he, one, one day, he, then he signed, here's what he did. He signed his father's day card with three oh. letters from his name. Oh. And that was, was like, Whoa, you know, this is yeah. nature. And it just popped out. And it's not like he had been copying or drilling on his name no 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 this was him doing it and we were like we, everybody was like this is it and yeah. seven months later seven months later um uh, his teacher was putting a word up on the word wall his amazing teacher and she had the word can and she said hey where do we put can on the word wall and he used his flip book and he went to c and he chose c wow and this three months later, he was writing about swimming with his dad. Mm. And all 
S, 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 space, 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 S, 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 S. So it's like this guy is on his way. He's like right. starting to very early sound spelling, right? Right. But he yeah. Didn't start out like that. And he did this over a period of four years. Yeah. Wow. That's good to hear. Oh, mm-hmm. it's yeah. amazing. Yeah. It is. Mm-hmm. Like, oh. Yeah. And, and he didn't do anything different than what a kid without disabilities does. He had right. opportunities to learn the alphabet, sound awareness, shared reading, chart writing, watching people write with his pencil. Um, I, it's just been all the same. It's mm-hmm. just comprehensive literacy instruction and it's right. coming up in his writing. That's but amazing. you also had documentation so you could yeah. see those changes in the progress and yeah. what that all meant. I love that. Yeah. Keep track of the writing. So that's why it's good to have a portfolio, keep it all together. And then, you know, it might be that you don't see any change right away, but we, in, in the letters, but you can assess the kid you know, their level of engagement. Are they learning about, are they understanding the routine of how to write? Are they looking at the letters? Are they listening and interested when you're rereading their work? Do they like to share their work? And, you know, in general, like the intent with using the alternative pencil, and then you could look at the adult. Are we facilitating the right way? Right. Uh, Then you can finally look at their writing sample. And we're learning a lot now because we have more writing samples. So we're able to see trends and patterns across time only right. because we have the writing samples right so you can't that's critical make judgments with one or two writing samples you have to have a bunch yeah you've so, given yeah, us so story. many strategies yeah it's, i feel like there's so many little pieces of this that i'm going to go back and listen to and take so thank you so much yeah all right well thank you so much for your time it has been a pleasure i know we could talk all day um, I'm every, every idea is landing. I have to tell you. So thank you so much mm-hmm. for, um, coming on with and talking to us today. Thank you. It was great to be here. Thanks.